This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Long Table 160. Um, and today I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Carsten Dahmen, who is Deputy Director of the Coin Cabinet at the Bode Museum in Berlin. Uh, Carson and I have known each other for a while now. We've got uh, a number of shared uh, personal as well as professional interests. Carson um, has been a curator of um, ancient coins, late antique, um, Byzantine period, Islamic, and the rest, and also has done a fair amount of work on medallic art, which is uh, one of our overlaps, and uh, we've done some work together on that. But we've also worked extensively on uh, digitization projects and um, Carson has been very um, uh, helpful in some of our online digital projects and has been uh, very deeply involved in digital projects uh, in Germany. Um, Carson has published dozens of articles as well as uh, a number of books including an important book um, in English actually uh, published by Routledge um, some years ago on the legend of Alexander the Great on Greek and Roman coinage. So it is my pleasure to turn it over to you, Carson, and um, let you talk about the collector, Charles Fox. So, yeah, once again, thank you, um, dear ladies and gentlemen. Um, by putting the name of a famous collector right in front of this lecture, it, it's quite obvious that one of the one of my objectives here is to focus on the prominent role individual collectors still have today for public collections and museums. They often do not only enrich either during their lifetime or posthumously museum collections, but themselves contribute to the field of numismatics through publications. Um, Friedrich Imhof Blumer of Winterthur in Switzerland, for example, as far as ancient coins is concerned, he died in 1920 being one of the prime examples for the latter case. The general Charles Richard Fox, though, is a bit different. Though having published some minor works, his collection only just now developed its own impact on numismatics. Please do not get me wrong. Already during his lifetime, the collection was considered one of the finest in Greek coins. But knowing that and being able to have access to those coins is somewhat different and still desired in parts today. In addition, the story of Fox's life, his family, and the story his coins tell are all key for our look into his personality as a collector. And without any doubt, the current most consequential impact Fox had as a collector is already visible online as the coin tickets he provided us with strongly pushed us, the coin cabinet, forward into publishing these provenance informations online at ikmksmb.museum slash ndp. The most intense time of acquisition for the Berlin cabinet was the period between the Franco-Prussian and the beginning of the Great War. So it's between 1870 and 1914. I name purchases uh, like the 1870 and 1892 Dannenberg medieval coin collections, 1873 Gansauge, 1873 Biedermann, Roman medallions, Fox himself, Hokest Osten, that's antiquity again, 1876 Guthrie, a British colonial officer in India, 1879 Grote medieval coins, the British captain uh, Zandes, 1879 84 Roman coins, 18 95 Fickenscher, that's South, South German coins, 1900 Imhof Blumer, that's antiquity again, the Abukir Hoard, 1902, 1906 Lubbecke, ancient coins, 1909 Posch, that's a classicist of the 19th century, and finally 
1911 Gariel Ferrari Carolingian coin. Contemporaries were very much aware of the size and dimension of these acquisitions, especially regarding the key year of 1873. No. Ah, sorry. Um, Friedlander, then the Munch Cabinet's director, writes. The year 1873 was the most elementary of the most elementary importance for the Münz cabinet. Never before had its most important department, writes the classicist, uh, made such a progress doing the introduction while doing the introduction to the newly established numismatic journal of the cabinet. And this was the first volume in 1874 of the Zeitschrift für Numismatik. Hence, from the perspective of the Münz cabinet, among the favorite lines, of course, uh, are those in the Numismatic Chronicle. I think I have quoted this already once, uh, reporting about the latest acquisitions of the Berlin cabinet. Um, the anonymous British writer says, we cannot, however, abstain from expressing our regret that the Zandes collection should have been lost to our own National Museum. This is now the third remarkable collection firmed by an officer in the English army, which has passed into the Berlin Museum. Those of General Fox and Colonel Guthrie being the two others. The next section reads, nevertheless, although we deplore the loss to England of so many priceless treasures, we are aware that in Germany, they will be appreciated by a cultured and intelligent people at their full value. A sentiment the writer most certainly will not have elaborated upon some 25 years later. A total of 1,200, 100, 12,133 coins were bought for 1,600 of 16,000 pounds sterling in October 1873. And as in every good Prussian household, funds were saved, of course, by selling off doubles. So a year later, the number has to, uh, been reduced to 11,000. 500. So who was this General Fox whose collection was the first to go to Berlin from its home in England during the golden age of acquisitions for the Münz cabinet? Charles Richard Fox, born on November 6, 1796, was one of the many British collectors of his time with a military background and without any doubt did build one of the most important collection of Greek coins in private hands in his age. Among his contemporaries were the Austrian Anton Prokash, Count of Osten, the Count of the East, whose collection is today kept in Berlin too, and who in a way shared a similar career with Fox. Well connected and better known for his political rather than his military career, Fox finally was able to call more than 12,000 coins his own, which he had selected for their individual beauty and not for any typological or numismatic importance within a series of issues. Shortly after his death on 13 April 1873, his collection was acquired by the Münz cabinet of Berlin. Fox's way of collecting coins, especially of having a habit of noting sources, provenances and prices on his coin tickets, allows us now, amongst other things, to identify his personal network of sources and acquaintances by making good use of these valuable pieces of information Fox had written with his own hand and always signed with his initials. 
in contrast, by the way, to Prokesh Austin, who kept the weights but not the provenance. In addition, with the help of documents from the Central Archive of the Berlin Museums, the Zentralarchiv, we already have shed some light into the purchase proper um, and the players involved. Fox had been born in 1796 as the illegitimate son of Henry Richard Wessel Fox, the third Baron Holland, through a liaison with Lady Webster, later divorced, uh, who then married Fox. Um, both his parents had a somewhat un-British habit um, of sharing a rather positive view of Napoleon Bonaparte. And I tell this story because their son gets involved in this. They finally became um, some kind of super fans of the late emperor and did actually send presents to him when in exile to St. Helen. Lady Fox was even mentioned in person but in Bonaparte's last will and did receive a gift from the emperor's request delivered by one of his generals. Um, this nice snuff box here now in the British Museum. And in a way, this snuff box too tells us a lot about the General Fox because this cameo, which has been given by the Pope to Napoleon, was by Napoleon um, um, used for the making of the snuff box. He provided a letter to Lady Fox. And when Lady Fox died in 1845, her son, General Fox, provided this box to the British Museum with another letter. And fortunately, our colleagues have put all of this information into their database. This peculiar interest was not unknown to her son, Charles Richard, as we did learn in 2021. And by the way, the web um, Wikipedia entry now has been updated to telling this story. 200 years earlier, when Bonaparte had died on 5th May 1821, the young Mr. Fox did actually visit St. Helena and simply nicked the key to the room in which Bonaparte had died on 6th September 1822. Nicely confessing on a piece of paper, he put the key when he gave it to his dear mother. And this was put up to auction uh, only recently. Fox had previously stayed with his parents during uh, their trip to Spain from 1802 to 1805. He was together with his tutor, the Reverend Henry Hart of Knapp in Scotland in 1807. Uh, when he was 11 years old, and attended Eton College for half a year. This was followed by another stay in Spain and Portugal with his parents. In 1809, he joined the Royal Navy and was present during the sieges of Cadiz in 1810 and Tarragona in 1813. In the same year, 1813, now aged 17, the midshipman Fox left the Royal Navy to continue travels with his family, this time on the continent. Uh, it was obviously still not decided on what should become of this young man, uh, as the common choices did not seem attractive to him, as his father writes. The Navy was not his favorite, church service neither, and the study of law was also not appreciated. Um, finally, a rather desperate father, father did agree to his son's wish um, to join the army. And in June 1815, the month of uh, Waterloo, Ensign Fox joined the 85th Regiment of Foot. Based at Chatham and Liverpool first, Fox traveled to Naples, Venice, Munich, and Brussels. Certainly his family background did help as he was appointed adjutant to Sir Frederick Adam in Corfu in July, 1817. Together with his commander, 
Fox traveled to Greece, Maria, and Albania. He became a lieutenant in 1818 while attached to the Royal West Indian Rangers, a captain in 1824, a major in 1825, and a lieutenant colonel in 1827. In 1837, Fox reached the rank of colonel and that of a major general in 1856, uh, 46. He was promoted to lieutenant general in 1854 and finally full general in 1863. For some time, and this certainly did help his military career, he was an adjutant first to Queen Adelaide of Saxon Mining, then her husband, King William IV, and finally of Queen Victoria from 1830 to 1846. As far as his private life is concerned, Fox in 1824 engaged into his first marriage to Lady Mary, uh, herself born as a project of an affair between the later King, William IV, and Dorothea John. After her death in 1864, Fox married in the following year Lady Catherine, the daughter of John Maybelly, a member of parliament. Here we have the tombstone, uh, the sarcophagus. Um, on one side, we have the data on General Fox and his second wife, and on the other side, that's of Lady Mary. From 1831 to 1835 and 41 to 47, Fox was a member of parliament too, and he became surveyor general of the ordinance in the 1830s and 1840 to 52. As a collector, Fox published two volumes of his engravings of unedited and rare Greek coins in 1856 and 1862. These represent a selection from the already famous collection and give testimony of his personal numismatic 19th century Network 2. Uh, I've marked a few names here. So we have on the right side, top, Mr. Whittle of Smyrna, a merchant, Mr. Bergen of the British Museum, who we meet later, and also Mr. Augustine Langdon, a lawyer with close relationship to Fox himself. Um, and of course, um, yeah, we have a, a few other uh, gentlemen mentioned too, Mr. Newton, uh, the famous Duc de Lune, uh, um, French archaeologist and collector, and also somebody quite unknown to me still is Mr. Dodell, who was the artist doing the engraving. Um, of course, we take some pleasure in um, showing you one of the engravings and the coin proper, which is now here in the Berlin cabinet. And here we have a uh, somewhat bigger image of this Pritzikos sat here. Um, there are only a few other publications regarding Fox, um, which are um, sales catalogs. So we have uh, this 23-page catalog of 1852. Um, and there's also uh, the library sale, um, posthumously of the Fox collection of numismatic books, because those were not the, uh, part of the purchase by the Berlin cabinet. The publication of the second volume of um, happened on Fox 66 birthday. And this was also presumably the occasion on which this medal by Edgar Böhm was produced, uh, giving us the core information and the portrait of the general on the obverse and uh, his inventory book uh, with uh, the coin numbers involved. And of course, uh, his signature and the very same signature we also find on his ticket. Um, so we do not have any information on how actually this medal uh, made it to Berlin, but we have to assume it came with this collection. 
Um, as I said, uh, the reverse did show us uh, the inventory book and a um, really nice uh, thing about this is we actually have this inventory book of Fox because it was given to us with the collection. Um, so this is how it looks uh, and it gives us the last total on uh, Fox's last uh, birthday uh, in this world on 6th November 1872. He died in March of the following year, in April of the following year with 12,118 coins. Uh, it has notes attached to it and summary overviews, but the general also did save paper because um, he simply turned the book around when it was full and filled the pages left uh, in the first uh, go through this uh, inventory. Much more important than these qualities of an administrator is Fox's peculiar habit of um, adding um, an individual ticket to each of his coins. Signed with his handwritten signature, the ticket actually being used from printed invitation notes of the Fox household. These tickets provide prices and provenance information. And they were, as I already said, the starting point for us to uh, process this data and provide it online. So when you search for Fox, in our uh, Münz Cabinet Authority file portal, NDP, NDP. You, you under persons have this, this list of individuals and these are mostly all collectors uh, from which, from whose collection co uh, Fox actually had coins. And here, for example, the Mr. Böke, um, that's uh, another Thassabee sale in the 1850s. Uh, is described in his uh, detail here. Quite helpful in researching uh, researching these uh, auction sales is the work done by Manville and Robertson in eight, 1986, the, the British numismatic auction catalogs of, seven, of 1720 to 1984, which helped us to decipher the abbreviations of names provided by Fox. In consequence, um, this permits a digital representation of personal networks, uh, like in this case here at Museum Digital, that's an international, but also German national uh, database to which we import our data. And it's very convenient because it connects the entry for one individual via the objects with other individuals. And, um, it's a nice thing to play around with. Um, for example, Henry Perigal Borel, of course, who is a prime source for lots of people, including Prokash Austin and Fox. Fox personal interest in coins, and I'm not aware of any autobiographical information, seems to originate from his early travels in the Levant in the 1820s, obviously, um, when attached to the military. Um, we have here a ticket on a Philetyrus tetradrachm, and uh, you're quite able to read uh, the ticket, of course, bought in 1820 uh, at Smyrna for 120 piastres. Um, and Similar, this Arados Tetradrachm, which he also bought at Smyrna for 70 piastres, and the piaster, of course, is not anymore the full taler like coin, but uh, the billion Kurush coin in the Osman, Ottoman Empire. In 18... Uh, 20, also in 1820, um, this, this humble bronze coin was, was bought by, by Fox. And it's mostly interest, uh, of interest because of this ticket, which said that it was found in a watered system together with other coins uh, near 
Poilly. And in uh, 1821, he bought uh, at Corfu, I think that's where he was based, obviously, this tetradrachm by one Signora Manzano. I haven't been able to identify this gentleman uh, yet. Um, as far as I can tell, these are the earliest purchases by Fox, the early 1820s, um, who did collect, uh, and Fox did continue to collect coins during the 1820s and 30s, though on a much lower level um, than later in life during the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. Um, one must know that Fox moved from the Levant, uh, uh, and I think he stayed in Canada for a period of time with his wife, and they moved back to England um, in the late 1820s or 30s. Uh, and this is also reflected in the way how he purchases coins, because now dealers take over. And this is one such example, a coin um, that he had bought in 1825 of the dealer Matthew Young, 1771 to 1837. Um, and it's one of the earliest coins he bought from, uh, from Young. Um, the 1840s saw a remarkable rise <coughs> in acquisitions. Um, now the Paris and London coin trade takes over. So we come across names such as Sotheby's, Christie's, and the London dealer George Eastwood uh, in London, and Henry Hoffman, and Roland and Feuardon in Paris. In particular, these companies now become Fox key sources for new coins often enough from old collections. This is how, how, uh, how Fox was able to acquire lots of his coins coming from old collections. In his documentation, as shown by his tickets, naming sales and auctions, years and lot numbers, Fox does show a habit of uh, quite fitting to a quartermaster general. Uh, one example is this coin here, this very nice, uh, lovely tetradrachm of Philip II, um, fittingly being commented upon by the general with a splendid coin remark. Um, it also provides us with the information that in 1864 it was bought of Merlin, and Merlin, of course, is also a quite uh, interesting figure uh, in the Levant. Um, we have here the same coin uh, in our database now, and the database also provides you with information on the individuals involved. So both uh, Merlin and Fox are uh, described here a lot of with, uh, together with a lot of other linked open data. At least on one occasion, Fox traveled to Paris to attend an auction, in this case, the Creon sale by Henri Hoffmann in 1867. Um, and the ticket plainly tells us the story. I bought this myself at the sale with the date. Um, it also has the lot number. Um, it gives us the weight in grains and the price. So there's really anything more we can wish. Uh, except that this coin comes from a hoard. So we have the full story here. Um, uh, and we have the representation of the coin in the sales catalog. So it's like the full Monty of numismatic provenance one can actually desire. Uh, again, here the entry on the collector Gréon. Uh, here we have the coin together with all the linked data information. And here we have the Greek coin hoards uh, database of the ANS, which provides us with, with the information 
on the Suez Canal road, which is Thompson uh, 1693 or IG Field 1693. Fox himself did name two collectors um, by dedicating his engravings to them. Um, the first volume was dedicated to the Duke of Lune, a French archaeologist. Um, quite famous with a huge collection, which is now in the Paris cabinet, fittingly. Um, here we have uh, a photo of a medal of the Duke, which is part of a photographic collection we have here in the Münz cabinet. And the loose plates, more or less, which are not in a book on which I have to work, uh, are published uh, uh, under the e-museum uh, feature of the EKMK or coin database, but you may know, please, that it's only visible when you switch to the German side of things on this table. Um, the second volume of the engravings honors uh, A.W. Langton, um, Augustine William Langton, a lawyer and coin collector of Trinity College in Cambridge, and of course, Lincoln's Inn, whose collection in 1856 and 58 had been, had been sold by Sotheby's. Um, Langdon must have been a close friend. He was later involved in the purchase of the collection. Here we have one of his coins, and here we have the information on Langdon himself. Fox also names the British Museum staff member, Thomas Bergen, 1787 to 1858, former merchant at Smyrna, again. Um, He's also known as a collector of coins and other antiquities who did some excavations too. So these were rather adventurous times. Bergen became a staff member in 1841 and in 1844 an assistant in the Department of Antiquities where he continued to work until his death in 1858. Um, again, here is the information. Uh, and also, and I really do appreciate that the British Museum has now done this, they have a concept database which um, provides information on collectors, previous owners, dealers, and so forth. Fox's familiarity with the British Museum and its staff would unfortunately result in some mutual embarrassment as Fox, well known at Great Russell Square, was seemingly able to introduce visitors to the museum by providing recommendations. And he finally did so once too often when a certain Timoleon Vlasto uh, did show himself not worthy of the general's trust in 1849. Vlasto, having been recommended by Fox to the BM, did not only steal coins from his host, but also from the British Museum when allowed access in the study room. Quickly being identified as, as the culprit when coins went missing, the issue went to court and found most grateful room in the newspapers home and abroad. Seems a bit familiar. Less surprisingly was the sentence of 10 years of deportation of Lasto arrived in Australia on 28th May 1851, but have a, let's have a look at the press. So we have already a few of the individuals involved marked here. Um, so um, the story was that the label of a coin um, was, was found on the floor. So there was some disorder and people start to having a keen eye. Um, and finally, they were even um, able to find as its lodgings, uh, the coins missing. Um, this is the spectator. Um, then the news even made it to Germany. Uh, and the funny thing is this um, text here and the numbers given in the Blätter für Münz, Siegel und Wappenkunde have obviously been copied 
from the examiner because they provide the very same information. Um, so Google, yeah, is again a very familiar phenomenon in a way. Um, finally, of course, uh, he was sentenced. Um, the reason though seems to be a bit broad um, because lots of us have to commit to such a habit, being monomatic as regarded to coins. I really like this statement. Um, as I said, he was sent to uh, Australia. The Australian government fortunately provides data on that too. Uh, we know the ship, we know when he arrived, and uh, we also know that he happily married her. Um, so going back to Fox himself, another BM employee besides Bergen was Charles Thomas Newton, uh, by whom Fox was given status of Alexander the Great from the Lana cohort uh, of 1870. This is Thompson number 1472, IGCH 1472. Uh, one of them as a birthday present in 1871. Um, Newton uh, did share the unwelcome pleasure to having a peer at court together with Fox and Bergen. Uh, this is himself here, and again, some biographical information on the gentleman. Um, other coins from this hoard were um, sold by uh, Robert Hamilton Lang, yet another uh, British banker, diplomat, and coin collector. Uh, here we have this coin in our database, again, with all the information, including the link to Greek coin hoards. Um, and here we have, again, the description of the hoard and the whereabouts for the coin. We already met uh, Charles Merlin, a British uh, consulate, a rather infamous figure uh, as far as uh, provenance is uh, concerned. There is some biographical information uh, and secondary literature on the gentleman. We already had a look at the coin previously. Another important person, um, whom we come about quite often is the merchant James John Whittle of Smyrna, 1819 to 1883, with this wonderful coin again from the Sidon Cider Hoard. Uh, here we have an, a painting of this gentleman. Uh, and Smyrna truly was a, a hotspot for numismatics, obviously, in the 19th century. Uh, another coin here comes from Jean-Pierre Maynard, uh, a, a Belgian diplomat. Uh, here we have him. Um, and this connection goes again via Henry Hoffmann in, in Paris, who, of course, one of the key dealers in the 19th century or the second half of the 19th century. Um, Another coin from Laodicea uh, points to a British uh, collection within the nobility. So that's uh, Pembroke, uh, who died in the early 18th century, but uh, the collection was only sold in 1848. Um, and uh, General Fox, now in the prime of his collector's life, had the funds, obviously, to purchase quite a number. Um, yeah, here we have him in 18th century attire, uh, 17th century, 18th century attire. He died in 1733, right? Um, there's also the uh, Ainsley collection. Um, so again, quite early collection, the gentleman died in 1812. Um, the collection partially we have been published by Zestini. Um, 
of course fox did did buy some coins um it's not obvious that he kind of picked certain individuals or whole whole areas or subject but possibly was at at the sale or wrote uh, to his his agent when acquiring coins um again here are the all the information also available online to you at our database um the same coin by the way uh after ainsley went into the uh, possession of the Baron Northwick, who's a quite naughty character. Uh, he had to flee to the continent because of his debts. Um, so he was one of the people who didn't pay their bills, but he had a lot of coins. Um, so when we have a look at uh, the sources for, uh, for Fox, we see that the most important, of course, are the, the famous dealers, Sotheby's, Christie's, Eastwood, Hoffman, and Ronan and Fernandin. But others are Abdi, uh, Bayer, the Belgian secretary, uh, lots of, let's say, mid-level collectors in England and the British Islands. Uh, we, we have, of course, Borel here from Smyrna but also the Duke of Devonshire or William Sheffers. Um, yeah, you name it. There are, as I said, quite a lot of gentlemen from, from England, um, very few foreigners, one of them being a doctor and Madame Zouquet of Beirut. Um, the only information I found about them was uh, on them was in Fairlay's two years in Syria. Um, so Dr. Zike must have been a physician and obviously dealt in coins. Um, yeah. So now we will turn from the Fox collection and his and Fox network to the actual um, process of, of acquiring such a high value collection for the Royal Cabinet. And it's quite fascinating story, especially knowing how things would work today. Besides Friedlander's Zeitschrift Film with Magic report, that's what you're seeing here. We only have uh, a few pages in the cabinet's history of 1877. Um, and there the event is described in a very sober manner. It only said, I, Friedländer, did study the collection in the spring of 1873 by order of our general department, and soon later the purchase was done. That's a very brief sentence for a very adventurous few months period in 1873, and the timing isn't even right because. Um, Friedländer wasn't there in the spring of 1873. Uh, thanks to the papers stored in the museum archives, uh, we are able to understand of how much of an understatement these lines actually are, who was involved, including the royal family in Berlin, and to actually fully appreciate the professional way things went ahead in the administration. Ah, here we have the, the relevant section in the Königliche Münzkabinett, the history. So we move to London. When Fox died after a long illness with not fully reaching 70, 70 years of age on 13th April eight, um, 1873, his coins were in his house as number one Edison Road in Kensington directly west of Holland Park. Um, the building which stands there today is not the actual building of 1873. Um, the coins were kept there in two 24 wooden cabinets, each of those holding 16 trays, so 384 trays altogether. Um, 
the red cross marks German street that were Friedländer state uh, while uh, being in London. And here we have, of course, um, number one, Edison Road. The keys to the collections were with the previously mentioned lawyer, Augustin William Langdon, a long year friend and counselor of the deceased, writes Friedlander in one of the papers he provides on this subject. We do not fully know when Friedlander got news of Fox passing away and if there had been any um, talks previously. But on 21st June, uh, Friedlander wrote a note, which is now kept in the archive, in which he reflects upon the character of the collection of Greek coins um, within the Royal Museums and uh, all the desires related to this subject. Um, elaborating on the desires, he continues that now there is a very rare opportunity um, ahead to strengthen this um, subject of Greek coins within the royal collections, because there fortunately happens to be a very important coin collection by General Fox be available on the market uh, for presumably um, 20,000 British pound or 500,000 French from. A lot of coin dealers are said to be already on their way to London, um, but it seems that the owner and the German term implies that this is Lady Catherine, would prefer to sell the collection as a whole. So in between the lines, it's very clear that some information had been changed with London and things being prepared before Friedlander actually raised his hand and talked to his superiors. This is shown by a letter of the French, I say French coin dealer, Ori Hoffmann, on June 26. Um, I, I do stress French because he stays in Paris. He's considered a Friedlander a Frenchman, and that's not a compliment. Um, but he actually comes from Hamburg. Um, this letter in French is Hoffmann's answer to a earlier letter, which has not been preserved, I think for good reason, by Friedlander. Hoffman writes that he has been talking to a representative of Lady Fox and that price will be 500,000 francs. He, Hoffman, would stay away from the deal if granted a commission of 5%. Um, he would travel or will be traveling to London next week and uh, to have a look at the collection and evaluate with Friedlander may stay in Berlin and he would uh, deal with all things uh, relevant. Um, well, this strategy is certainly not Friedlander's. Um, he answers in German um, on 28th June that his superior, the general director of the Royal Museums, the Count Usedom, um, desires a report on the Fox collection. And this is why he, Friedlander, will travel to London or, uh, in order to meet Hoffmann and have a look at the collection. Uh, Hoffmann is kindly asked to provide the address of uh, the Fox household and uh, which would Friedlander collect uh, when traveling to Paris. Already on 4th of June, here we have, uh, of course, the information uh, on Hoffmann. Friedlander um, reports um, from London to Usedom that he already had a look at about a quarter of the collection, which had shown, been shown to him by Hoffmann and Langdon. Uh, the price still is 20,000 pounds sterling, uh, according to Hoffmann. But uh, Hoffmann is quite 
um, positive to lower this price to 16,000 uh, pounds. Um, Friedlander continues with some critic on Hoffmann regarding his French character um, and some doubts on his assessments of the value. Um, Friedlander writes that he's going to talk to Langdon on his own, leaving Hoffmann out. Um, it's not totally clear when Friedlander actually reached um, London, presumably on first of third of July. Um, he traveled by train via Cologne and Brussels and not via Paris. Um, Friedlander stays until July 12th uh, at the third at three German Street St. James. I wasn't I was in this street of course um, I wasn't able to identify a hotel there and not on any maps. Unfortunately, an answer comes per telegram on July 8th and asks Friedlander to take his time, but when he returns, travel via Paris to evaluate the statue which is being offered by Lambros dealer. So there's no way taken by a Berlin courier without any professional background, obviously. Already on Thursday, the uh, 10th of July, Friedlander sends his report. Um, sorry. Here we have uh, again the situation uh, in the center of the hotel and on the left hand side, the Fox household. Already um, on December 12th, uh, the report is sent by Friedlander in which he praises the um that's it in which he praises the collection and its value in quality and the number of coin types represented uh, all of which he states are missing the burning cabinet the price is still twenty thousand, um which result from a summary of the individual coin ticket prices, which is something, of course, Friedlander does not really appreciate. The most important information, though Friedlander is available to tell, is that the British Museum will not be a part of this competition, as Mr. Langdon and also the museum numismatics, uh, the creators have told him that because of the recent acquisition of the Weigen collection, the British Museum lacks fund, funds and interest in buying any coins currently. Those colleagues certainly did include Reginald Stuart Pohl, the keeper uh, at the Department of Coins and Medals, and uh, Mr. Newton, which obviously is Charles Thomas Newton, 1816 to 1894. What Friedlander doesn't really tell, but what becomes obvious when reading the correspondence is that he must have spent a lot of time talking to people involved. And this shall be very fortunate in the future. Um, because um, the gentlemen, by desire of Lady Catherine, are asked to do a new evaluation of the collection and a setting of a price for the whole collection. Um, and this, Friedlander hopes, is a way to get rid of Hoffmann. Um, he also continues that there was no um, opportunity to talk to um, other dealers like Webster and Lincoln uh, because they simply lacked any material of interest currently. Uh, but um, Lambros' father and son are in London currently, he writes, will return to Paris, where we will have a look at the aforementioned statuette at the Hotel de Vendée. Uh, Friedlander describes the collection in the British Museum in the highest uh, of words, uh, and he calls it quite depressing from a Berlin perspective, 
meaning that the Berlin collection is quite minor when compared with the British Museum. Um, so he calls it a zwerg, a dwarf. Friedlander also expects um, to have a look at a Russell painting. So he really has lots of things to do while in London. Um, uh, a painting that the Berlin Museums will not buy by. Um, Friedlander's next letter from Paris um, is fittingly of July 14th and is only important because um, now we have to move, there it is, because Hoffmann is mentioned again, um, who has his suspicions regarding the re-evaluation of the collection. Uh, Hoffmann again uh, talks about 16,000 pounds, which is uh, quite interesting, um, and comes with a strategy of offering 16,000 coins in a very short period for this offer. And this strategy uh, is something Friedlerner doesn't approve of. Um, he wants that his um, director general, Count Usedom, contacts Lady Catherine directly and commits himself. And this works. Following his return to Berlin, Friedlander on the 22nd of July, again, stresses the British Museum's collections quality and adds a note from Pohl, which um, yeah, there it is, which tells us that they are ready to finalize the deal. Um, in a second line of events, another Berlin agent is set and sent to, to London. Uh, and this is the young Wilhelm Bode. So the later famous uh, general director Wilhelm von Bode, then still not ennobled. Um, and he gets quite direct instructions by Usedom uh, regarding the uh, collection Fox. And Bode is now kind of the uh, additional pair of eyes and ears in London. It is quite interesting to read the later memoirs by Bode, which kind of exaggerate his, his role, but it's quite obvious that all the people he's talking to are people which have been kind of set on the right, um, uh, into the right position and arguments by Friedlander previous. Friedlander now on the 4th of August receives a confidential note by Pohl that um, um, Lady Catherine is planning to sell the collection next year if there's not an offer. And the offer has to be 16,000 pounds sterling. Um, so finally, we, we got the, the, the value that we all been asking for. Um, and my suspicion is that the gentlemen involved here, so also uh, the people working for Lady Catherine and the Berlin staff did actually work hand in hand. Um, Border receives the same information and sends a telegram um, to Berlin. That's on the right hand side. So Friedlander answers on the 5th of August. Um, so the general died the 30th April. And with the express permission by Usedom, declares that the Royal Museums are planning to buy this collection. Um, but as the collection is such an important and expensive one, of course, um, they write that His Majesty the Emperor has to approve and ask for a little bit more time. Uh, Usedom now makes sure that border is up to date and uh, receives a, a telegram. And um, another telegram is sent to somebody 
a bit more important. Um, and this is the crown prince, who is a kind of cultural officer of the German Empire. And uh, he is, of course, um, informed and sends a rather short uh, reply, which says, mit Vorschlag einverstanden, do agree to your suggestion. So this means the go ahead. Already on the 9th of August, another telegram is sent, um, which um, confirms Poole's letter. So they make sure that everybody receives his two lines. Um, uh, Poole also writes that Lady Fox would like to have a confirmation and that the company Engelbach um, are her bankers ready to receive the money. So, on 7th August, um, Uthodom writes in French to Lady Fox in this matter, and uh, Newton sends another answer, uh, and in the name of Lady Fox uh, agrees to this suggestion. So now the deal is made and the hands shaken. Um, there's also another personal letter by Lady Fox. So we do have everybody involved in their own words and lines by their own hand. She writes not from Kensington, but from th three Elden Place in Broadstairs, Kent. Um, this is her letter and this is her uh, vacation place here. So in between, Paul sends another letter uh, by Lady Fox asking uh, that the coins are being uh, identified in the Berlin collection in the future, which is no problem for the Berlin cabinet because that's the habit we already had from 1840. Each coin has the provenance on it if we have a provenance. Um, and now Friedlander does the thing I think he desired most. He gets rid of Hoffmann. So Hoffman can forget his 5% of commission because uh, Hoff Friedlander simply writes, well, I'm so sorry, I'm in Berlin. I'm not involved in this matter. You have to talk to Bode. So the, the colonel is pointing to the private um, and poor Hoffman was in between. The imperial um, the There it is. The imperial permission for the purchase now um, is sent again via telegram. Uh, it involves lots of people, um, the secretary, uh, the head of the imperial um, cabinet uh, and office. So um, they also have to fit it into the budget. Uh, 16,000 pounds sterling have to be translated into thalers. We are still in the thaler period. The mark just having been introduced. So uh, one taler is three marks. Um, but the remarkable thing is that the museum administration did only need a mere seven days to make the deal once everybody um, who was participating in that did agree to the facts. And this is quite important. And it was only 23 day, day, days for providing the imperial permission of purchase. And this is really a, a remarkable feat. The only thing left to deal with was now the physical transport of the collection. Friedlander wrote on 24th August a note in this matter. Um, that's, where is it? No. Ah, I'm sorry, I seem to be lost in those notes, um, in which he describes how the coins were kept by Fox. We already hold, uh, heard the story of those 24 wooden cabinets. Um, and he now gives advices how the coins are being packed. So they need to be taken from their trays and put into paper and wood wool, and I think then in boxes. But obviously, they kept the tickets with each coin. So it must have been a quite laborious individual packing of 
point. On 6 September, um, the Imperial Embassy in London, uh, for this is it, um, in London is informed that Dr. Heinrich Heidemann, a naturalist, um, later a professor at Halle University, will serve the career court. Um, a copy of the letter um, describes Heidemann's role in French and serves as a kind of passport. Um, Fox cabinets were sold for 50 pounds um, at Roland for a day's sh um, um, shop at Great Russell Street, um, hence paying for Heidemann's expenses. Um, and as soon as 27th September, um, the Royal Museums received the bill for the transport um, over 488 marks and 90 pfennigs. That's less than, um, let's say, a good laborer's yearly income. Finally, on 25th October, Friedlander is able to write a note of accession to his superiors, that's it, and a similar note in our accession book with the date. And um, the nice thing they did with these uh, accession books and huge collections are the last lines here. As each coin has a ticket with it, there's no need for a record in this session book. That's very curative for me. Um, of course, then we have the reports and publications on the collection. Um, and let's have a look at this, this medal of Fox again when looking at where the cabinet then stand. So they were busy putting these 12,000 coins into their collection, getting rid of about six, 700 doubles, um, and already had their eyes trained on the next, I don't say victim, but subject of desire, which is the Prokesh Austin collection. And um, it's quite funny to see how this well oiled machinery of acquisitions in this period did actually work. And the fortunate thing regarding this Austrian collection was that this former ambassador, Prokash Austin at Athens and Constantinople, had quite a grunge against his superiors. So he was willing as an Austrian to sell his collection to Berlin. So, I do thank you for your very kind attention, uh, attention and your time. Thank you, Carson. Thank you. That that was uh, that was wonderful. That was fascinating, informative, and of course very entertaining. And in fact, I've got to uh, try to work a way or find a way to work in that comment about Vlasto being a monomaniac regarding coins. Yeah. <laughs> was very good. Yeah. Uh, we we can take yeah. a, a question or two if if there is one. Yeah, of course I will. Thank you, Mary. Good to see you. Yeah, there, there. Uh, Chuck, go ahead. Nice to see you too. Oh, yes, uh, Carsten, that was wonderful. Very interesting. I uh, the only question I really have is that that very pretty metal. How rare is that metal? Well, you, you know, get me on the wrong foot. I I haven't checked. Um, that's one of the habit of museum curators. We have to stop in the collection. We don't look on how to get it once we have it. Um, so I, I, I'll i check and I let Peter know and I think he can provide the information to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, may I ask a question, please? Uh, please, go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks for a really interesting talk. I especially uh, was interested in all the information that's available online. Um, number of the charts reference the uh, authority file portal. Is there a simple way to access that from the museum's website? Uh, there's a wealth of information, number of tabs at the uh, website. Is there a simple way to get to that portal? Well, I suggest you you type 
ikmk.smb.museum slash ndp. Okay. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so it's not easily accessible directly from the um, the Munzkabinit um, uh, website. So one ought to go in from um, uh, from what you've suggested. Okay. Well, it's it's also um, accessible from our object database, IKMK. There's a, 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 we call it a writer in German, a writer or a horseman, which is uh, okay. uh, at the very top and it is labeled NDP. Okay. Uh, that's, it's just a click away. Okay, I will, okay, I will, uh... Give me something. Give me something to poke. Around. Could you give me that uh, that address one more time? Uh, I can write it in the chat. Yes. Yeah, please. That'd be great. That'd be that'd be great. Thank you. And again, thanks again for a really informative talk. I really really appreciated the uh, the You're visuals. Welcome. Yeah, and in fact, I, I would encourage all of you to uh, check out the EKNK site. It, it, really is fantastic as well as the uh the berlin um moon's cabinet site as well too it really is um you know quite well done yeah carson's dropped that into the chat uh john do you jonathan do you have a question yeah hi carson uh no, thank you and um um hi and you should also mention to people the article in the um uh, in that 19th century volume my question is a simple one. What do you think um, uh, Poole's and Newton's motivation were for helping so much? Was it to keep it in a museum? Was it to help the widow? Or was it a combination? Uh, did you ever get a sense as to why they were so supportive of the uh, Berlin Museum buying it? Yeah, that's a very good question indeed. And the, the key problem is that um, there's no written kind of report on these things besides the very official publications and acquisition notes. Um, I'm not aware of, of anything in Friedlander's letters, but I will check again. Um, it shows you how I different the world was before the uh, First World War and how we kind yeah, of... Yeah, it's, it's a different time. Uh, I think it was a, a kind of community of kind of imperial collection curators in a sense much more or not not much more i think we've reached the state again yeah uh, of a very um friendly collaborative numismatic world um and i i really do think and you're very much right in saying that that they would have despised the selling of a collection in parts. They, I think people like Poo too had a kind of sense that these huge collections, having been built over decades, um, deserve to be preserved as a whole. And any museum curator, of course, fancies a collection as a whole, also because it's cheaper than the individual coins altogether. And usually it comes with yeah, yeah. It's so funny to see this these different habits. Like Fokesh Austin gives you three digits uh, for the gram weight yeah, of a coin, but very rarely any information. And and Fox is just full on that. And even the grain weights in if Fox provides one, which is very rare are quite accurate. 306 grains and five tens were the ones for Veronique the second. Wow, he, he must have had uh, quite the scale. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Anyone. Well, Carson, I'd like to thank you again. That really was a wonderful presentation and uh, really enjoyed it. And, you know, particularly from the museum curator perspective, um, being able to see how uh, all of this, you know, operated and functioned in the 19th century. So 